HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Heritage Foods USA, the nation's largest distributor of heritage breed pigs and turkeys. For more information, visit heritagefoodsusa.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the Heritage Radio Network. We are coming to you, as always, live from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. You are listening to The Farm Report, and I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks. And today we are on the line with Ed Stair, who is the Executive Director of New York FarmNet and New York Farm Link. Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you. So the organization that Ed runs was featured in a, in a recent Newsweek article entitled Death on the Farm that profiled um, a number of farmer suicides that have been happening over the past couple of years throughout the U.S. And, and I thought we'd start, um, I want to I wanna get into that, but before we do, I want to talk a little bit more about your organization and what type of services you provide to farmers. Okay, uh, New York FarmNet has been around since the mid '80s in response to there was a agricultural crisis at the time, somewhat similar to the mortgage crisis, where values of farmland had appreciated and then the bottom fell out and caused a great deal of stress in the farming community. And FarmNet was created in response to that crisis at the time, but since then. We've evolved into much more than that. We're try- we are much more proactive than in the past. Um, when the program started, when it first started, it was totally crisis intervention and uh, lots of stress calls. But now we get into such things as helping the next generation come back to farm, or if a farmer wants to do something differently guiding them through the process of developing a business plan to see if their ideas are feasible. Uh, and we have two types of consultants, financial consultants who have a background in agriculture and at least a bachelor's degree, and we have personal consultants who uh, work with the family issues, and they all have their master's in social work, and so the two work together as a team because the family issues and business issues are often intertwined, and there are a lot of profitable farms out there that can't make it to the next step because the family isn't getting along. Now, in 2013, you guys dealt with over 6,000 requests for your services. You worked with almost 1,000 farms, almost 2,000 individuals. Is that Are those numbers consistent um, with, with where they've been? Are you seeing an increase or a decrease in the need for your, your services? Well, we... The increase... The needs change as the agricultural economy changes. When the price of milk was really low, there were there was an increase in calls, and uh, since then, the level has been pretty much consistent because we're doing the proactive work instead of requesting something for while well, I'm I need to put together a refinancing package because the 
can't meet cash flow commitments compared to I want to bring my son or daughter into the business. How can I do that? What do I need to do to get started? So it it varies, but that's pretty much consistent with uh, contacts to the office. And, and they come not only by phone but by email, and we have both a website and a Facebook page. So I, I want to talk um, a bit about one of the farmers, one of the New York State farmers who is featured in the in the Newsweek article, and I, I remember you know hearing this story when I was living upstate. Um, I wonder if you can tell us about Dean Dean Pearson, and just for folks who aren't familiar with that, give us a, a brief overview of that, which I feel like is probably at the bleakest aspects um, of some of your work. It is, and we do receive some of those calls, and one of those calls was profiled. Uh, with Rachel, our program coordinator, who talked to a farmer at 2 in the morning who had a loaded gun. But uh, getting back to the Pearson case, all I know is what I've read in the media, the various papers, but the situation is the farmer felt that there was no hope for the future and uh, didn't thought there were no answers and ended up taking his life as well as uh, he shot all of the cows on the farm. It was very drastic. And, th- you know, that is definitely, you know, at the extreme end um, of, of of what folks do in any profession when they're faced with, an, you know, over overwhelming um, and, and bleak outlook. And, and I think the, the interesting thing about the Newsweek article, they posited a couple of different reasons as to, um, you know, why you might see an increase in, uh, in this type of activity for farmers. And I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of, of the lay of the land now from, you know, the kind of emotional, uh, interpersonal standpoint. Um, I feel like I've been hearing more and more this kind of cry from farmers in the middle, farmers who aren't, you know, selling at a, you know, New York City farmer's market and aren't, you know, a huge kind of commodity business. They're, they're somewhere in between, and I feel like that landscape is you know the ground is moving a little bit in ways that I can only imagine must be quite challenging to figure out on a day to day basis. And can you give us a sense of you know what's the vibe out there? What are you guys hearing in your offices? Um, you know what what should people be understanding about those you know farmers in the middle? Well, in upstate, and um, a lot of what we're hearing and seeing right now is uh, frustration with the lack of good weather conducive for planting. Some farmers feel that they're behind already and maybe getting stressed out. And uh, in some of the farms that you have mentioned, we uh, work with farms who may want to do something different with the farm business or add an enterprise or direct marketing or see how they can improve profitability so they can make a decent return for their investment. Um, and I think one of the things that, for some reason, for, for folks, especially like myself, who are existing in an urban environment, you know, the kind of realities of farming are often kind of hard to imagine. And, and one of the things I think that kind of people miss often is that, that farming is, is a business, um, that, that folks are, are, that's their job, that they're in it to make a living. And can you talk a little bit about what are some of the different, you know, business structures when you're looking um, at at a farm as a business? Um, you know, how would we talk about, you know, whether it's an LLC or it's a sole proprietorship, or what are some of those kind of terms and ways that we here can be thinking about farm businesses and the diversity of farm businesses? Well, the major, vast majority, ninety nine and a half percent of all farms are family owned. The, there's partnerships, uh, well, sole proprietorships, and partnerships, LLCs, corporations, and all, all of those are, and some of the more complex business structures, such as a limited liability company or an S corporation, are put together to allow for the transfer of the business to the next generation. Someone coming in can uh, with a limited liability company, have minimal equity, but still the profits can be divided any way the family agrees to. 
and that's a huge benefit, which is why we see more, one of the reasons we see more limited liability companies also is that it separates personal from business assets. And uh, as far as the other forms go, there's quite a few partnerships as well as sole proprietorships. So those are a rough overview. And getting back to some fact, uh, the factors related to the article, one thing explained in the article that sets farming apart from other businesses is that it's obviously 24-7 and uh, most families live on the farm. They're around each other all the time. And the farm may have been started by a father, grandfather, great-grandfather, so there's a great sense of pride there. And uh, what we often hear when we work in cases where they need some of the assistance on the personal side is that I feel I'm letting my ancestors down. If I can't make it, they could make it. Why can't I? But the landscape has changed so significantly, uh, those factors are difficult to take into account. Well, it's so you're not comparing kind of apples to apples, Be, you know, between no, generations. No, other businesses, you're not where if someone has a restaurant or a hardware store, they can uh, shut the door on Friday afternoon. Well, not so much with a restaurant, but any other business, and come back the next day or two. They live away from the business, but with a farm, it's entirely different. Yeah, I feel like, you know, just kind of imagining living, working, and spending kind of every waking moment with your your immediate and your extended family. I don't think it takes too long to imagine some of the issues um, that might come up that might be, you know, frustrating. In addition to, obviously, the, you know, the kind of benefits of a, that type of close-knit environment. But I think the, the, tran- the, tran- the farm transfer conversation is a really interesting um, space to kind of tease out some of some of these issues. You know, when you're thinking about um, you know farm owners having that farm being their primary um, investment, those are their their main assets. And and when you want to retire, you know, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the things that farmers face in retirement, in particular when they're looking to transfer their farm to somebody else who's part of the family? Some don't take into the full account what it really costs to live because the farm may absorb some of those expenses. I'd mention, let's say, the house is on the farm, so the farm may pay the taxes, the utilities, or the farm family may use fuel from the farm for their own cars, so they don't necessarily have an accurate picture, and uh, sometimes I've heard the comment that some can't understand why people can't live on twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars a year because they do. But when you add up all the extras that the farm supports, it's much, much more than that. So and that's something we see in working with farm families, and also the need to create a put a business structure in place to allow the next generation to come in and build equity and eventually take over. And that process, I mean, w- what about when there's, you know, multiple um, people who are part of the next generation and let's say maybe one wants to take over uh, and continue farming and the other wants to, to leave the farm? Um, you know, what challenges do those type of situations bring to bear? Oh, and quite a few when you get into the family issues. And some attorneys uh, often say that uh, in bringing someone into the business or equitable isn't always equal. If there's one sibling that spent considerable time on the farm and maybe built the value of that up through his or her efforts, uh, sometimes they have to uh, pay for their own good management when they buy the farm to uh, the siblings. And in other instances, a uh, farm family may have uh, life insurance po- life insurance policies on the owners, and uh, one sibling may get the farm, and the others would get the proceeds of the life insurance policy. So there are tools to use that, that farmers that can help farmers transfer the farm to the next generation. 
Well, that was one of the other things I know is common when you look at, you know, the change in farm size uh, in, in New York State and across the country. You know, we are seeing farms, you know, the trend is for farms to get larger. I think that's definitely what you hear um, here in New York is how farms are getting bigger and bigger and the small family farm is being squeezed out. But I was, you know, it's interesting um, when one farm is looking to, you know, as as their children grow up and let's say they have two, three um, or more kids who want to remain on the farm, suddenly you're needing to transition that business to, you know, creating income not just for one family, but for two, three or more. And can you talk a little bit about kind of what are some strategies that your team recommends when, when they have the opposite problem where everyone wants to stay on the farm and wants to like, you know, make a living off of that, you know, property that maybe was supporting, you know, one family and now is looking to support two or three or more? Well, what we, <clears throat> excuse me, do is come in and analyze the financial aspect of the business and see what can be supported. And then oftentimes it may not be feasible for everyone to stay or if they are all want to stay, um, make some suggestions for how they may do that and how they can grow the business to provide for the family living needs of additional business members and owners. And what some, what might be like some examples of that be those additional kind of add ons to the business? Oh, well, I can give you an example of a family we worked with where the son wanted to come in and he built equity over time in the dairy and before he was, I think he's in his late 20s, he purchased a neighboring farm that allowed the farm, that, the family farm, to expand. So that's one way in which something like that can be accomplished. And uh, what, what other types of areas would, do you think your view, uh, listeners would like to hear about? Well, I'm just, I feel like, um, you know, are they bringing different business aspects, like different, um, are they doing different things on the farm? Are they adding different components or are they just scaling up? So instead of milking 100 head of cow, we're going to milk 150 and look to expand doing the same thing or is the expansion more diverse than that where maybe you're going to add some other um, component or maybe looking to break into a, a direct market as opposed to going into the commodity market. Um, I just want to get a sense of, of what some of the options for folks are or, or what people are generally leaning towards. Okay, well, what New York Farm Net does, Net does is analyze the resources that are available to see if maybe something is underexploited if, let's say, if there's proximity to an urban area uh, or a main road going through the farm, is direct mark, does that fit into the plan, or could that be an enterprise to add additional income? No, that makes and sense. And there's no real one area that people are looking at. It's all, it depends a lot on the location of the farm and the management ability. Some farmers who say that, well, they need to sell more to the public and at the same time say, I'm farming because I like to be independent and I don't like being around a lot of people. Those two things aren't compatible. So that's what we try and do is find out uh, what the business and the management behind that business can do to make some changes in order to bring the next generation in and improve profitability and create opportunities. So same as same as any business, you're doing a skill a skill assessment, a resource assessment. You're kind of looking at the the location, the surrounding market, and and what the options are, and helping people kind of strategically think through those options. Exactly, and seeing what works best for them. We present them with some options and um, help them through the decision making progress process, and the ultimate decision is theirs what they decide to do and what best fits their goals and objectives. Um, Well, we're going to take a a break in just a moment here, but before we do, I want to touch on kind of the the intergenerational kind of culture aspect. I mean, I think you see that a lot, um, you know, with young kids, um, 
you know, having different ideas than their parents about, um, you know, what they want their life or the business to look like. And, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how those issues play out in, in the agriculture setting. Is it the same? Um, you know, I, I just, I can kind of like imagining, you know, you, you listen to different music, you have, uh, you know, maybe are tied more into the digital world and, and like what are some of those challenges in the agriculture environment? Um, is it more that there's like an evolution of agriculture that the younger generation is adapting that's being resisted by an older generation or or is that not so much the case? Well, sometimes that, that does happen for sure, but there are other instances where the senior generation may realize that's where things are going and... Uh, but they don't want to take that on, so they'll have their daughter or son take that on when they come into the business. Uh, one aspect may be precision agriculture, using uh, satellite information to manage fields on a, on a grid or a small area compared to a blanket application of fertilizer, just putting nutrients where the crops need it and at a level that uh, will result in the best and healthiest plants. So there's a lot of things that the incoming generation really is implementing that's beneficial, and uh, obviously there's resistance in some cases, but we see lots of opportunity for that to be an area of the business that they take over and build management skills and then uh, are in a position to take the entire business over. Well, we are going to take just a brief break, and when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about um, your, your organization's funding and where that's come from and some of the challenges in recent years. So hang tight. You're listening okay. to The Farm Report, and we'll be right back. Today's music is Just Because by the California Honey Drops on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Just because your mama said, and just because your friends told you to, just because you read in the news, and just because... Since 2001, Heritage Foods USA has sold pasture-raised, antibiotic-free heritage meats to restaurants and homes around the country. Our farmers raise their animals with care using traditional methods guaranteed to produce the very best-tasting meat. Our pork breeds include Berkshire, Red Wattle, Duroc, Gloucester Old Spot, Large Black, and Tamworth, and our beef comes from Piedmontese, Angus Akiyushi, Belgian Blue, Highland, Simmental, and Belted Galloway cattle. We also carry a rotation of 24 rare breeds of heritage chicken, seasonal specialties like lamb, goat, geese, and of course, heritage turkeys. Visit us online at www.heritagefoodsusa.com or give us a call at 718-389-0985 to place your order today. All right, we are back. We are on the line with Ed Stair, and we are talking about New York FarmNet. So where does the funding for your organization come from? And um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the challenges that, that you've faced with regards to funding? Oh, there, there are always challenges, but for the past two years, the state legislature has uh, restored us to a level where we can have some good impact, and we receive our funding through mostly through the state, through the Department of Agricultural and Markets and the New York State Office of Mental Health. And we work we provide materials such as annual reports that document our outcomes to and show how the organization is beneficial to the state's economy. There's a return on investment through New York FarmNet 
in the way of create areas of creating jobs, uh, increased capital investment by farmers who grow the business and buy new capital items, and increase in gross receipts. So improvements in profitability that result in more tax dollars to the state. So we talk about the way that overall our work with people uh, is the core of what we do, but it results in some pretty significant economic impacts from the investment at the state level. And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the working with the Office of Mental mental Health and and I think, you know, often there is a real stigma to f- folks who are dealing with mental health issues. And can was it was there resistance from, you know, was that always a clear priority for your organization? And does, do people chafe at that funding or, you know, do you face some of those kind of stereotypes? Oh, there are definitely stereotypes. And that's why our personal consultants have the title they do. I don't think... Uh, Anyone from the farming community would uh, be excited about calling a social worker, but if we bring in a family consultant, that's much more palatable. And do you? And yes, there are stigmas, and there are very few farmers who would drive their pickup into the county office of mental health and risk having someone see their vehicle there, which is why our work is confidential on the on the farm. And it's all we, it's around the kitchen table, and we have a limited amount of time we can work with farm families. But with the funding we receive, the service is free to the farm. Well, I was wondering about that. How do you, you know, I, I can only imagine, you know, when you're when you're dealing with, you know, six thousand plus requests and and working with so many farms. How do you decide, you know, where to allocate what? what I can only assume are your limited staff resources. Oh, it is a balancing act. We uh, assess if something could be done over the phone. Sometimes there may only need to be a follow-up call or a response to an email. And for some other more serious cases, we try and move things along in a way that are efficient. So, it, it does require a significant amount of management given the limited resources we have. And is this organization, I know you guys serve New York State, but is this type of work being done across the country on a state-by-state basis? Is there any kind of federal component to it, or is it really state-by-state or community-by-community? Community? It's state-by-state. State. Some states have... Uh, do something similar, but they issue vouchers for counseling compared to having uh, what we have is consultants who work part-time as needed on staff, so that helps in managing the resources where there's not a consistent salary and we can allocate resources where they're most needed. But in, in some of the other states, most of the states who had crisis hotlines and uh, concentrated on those alone have vanished compared to some of the other states who have taken on some more issues that uh, around farm profitability, sustainability to help farmers into the future. And FarmNet is one that's evolved over time, and we have a board of directors comprised of various aspects of the industry, from farmers to lenders and someone from the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets sits on the board to guide us in what we do and uh, help us find out where there are opportunities and look at areas we should be getting into and addressing. Well, I can imagine there's a real benefit to having an organization that already has roots in the in the farming community and you know a wide variety of resources to draw on that so that when a crisis does arise or there is suddenly a shift you know you're not a group of outsiders coming to kind of deal with you know stopgap measures but you're really there for like maintaining and supporting the long-term um, success and viability of, of the farming community here in New York State. Oh exactly and you uh 
pinpointed that in, in a way that there's a great deal of trust in the farming community with New York FarmNet because they know someone when they call the office, they'll always speak to a live voice. It's not automated. And we staff are on call 24-7. I've taken quite a few calls, nights, evenings, when things are serious. And uh, with that trust that our reputation is spread, and in a recent in a survey, 85% of farmers would recommend us to a friend or neighbor. Well, that's, that's great. And it's enviable, for sure. Um, Definitely. Well, I want to, um, you know, we have just another minute or two left, but I want to talk about and give you an opportunity to talk about some of the, the partnerships that you guys have been working on with other organizations to kind of support your work and look at expanding the resources that you're able to offer the farming community. Um, you know, in particular, you know, we've done a lot of work here at Heritage Radio Network with American Farmland Trust, and I know you guys are, are working on some stuff together, so maybe you could share some highlights for us. Sure. We're working with American Farmland Trust on a concentrated project in the Hudson Valley. Submitted a proposal with them, and we've always collaborated very well with American Farmland Trust. We uh, work closely with Cornell Cooperative Extension, we have industry support through various lenders and uh, someone from Farm Credit Serv- um, Farm Credit East is on our board of directors. So, and we recently partnered with the Family Business Center at Lemoyne College to bring in a national speaker and talk about farm business succession. That's great. So there, it would take a long time to list out who <laughs> we collaborate with. Uh, well, and, thanks for sharing some highlights. I also want to kind of shout out some of the the legislators that have been critical to your funding and to your work. I know in your um, your annual report, you shout out Patty Ritchie, Catherine Young, and Bill Maggi uh, as mm-hmm. folks who have been particularly instrumental. Um, anyone else I'm missing there? Uh, there? There are a few people on the mental health committee, Aileen Gunther, um, and my assemblyman, Gary Finch, has been good, as well as Senator Michael Nazolio. So they've all, they all know about our program and our impact, and we're very much appreciative of their support, as well as the support of their staffers. They all have excellent staff who are very knowledgeable about the things we do. So if folks want to learn more about your work, I mean, definitely they can visit nyfarmnet.org or newyorkfarmland.org. But what's the best way for, you know, us in an urban environment or, or folks out there who maybe aren't, um, you know, growing food or producing food, but obviously we're all consuming it. What's the best thing that we can be doing to support your work and to support New York State's farmers? Just uh, familiarizing oneself with the... Uh impact of agriculture as an industry and how much it's needed in New York State. There's a huge demand for milk to make yogurt. A lot of yogurt processors have come in, and agriculture presents an opportunity for the manufacturing sector and food to help create off-farm jobs for individuals and improve economic well-being of communities. So there's There's a lot to consider when looking at the industry as a whole and being educated consumers. And it's difficult to buy local with everything, but if you, there's a local farmer that uh, sells produce to establish relationships with the farmer to see what they have to go through just to uh, survive in business. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know even just kind of like looking, you know, looking at the labels, something something produced in New York State, you know, that that, that I think has those benefits as well. Well, Ed, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really interesting to talk with you and to learn a little bit more about your work, and we, we definitely hope that you'll stay in touch. Okay, thank you, and please uh, like us on Facebook. Awesome. For folks who want to check out that Newsweek article, uh, it is available online. It was from... Uh, April 10th, it's Death on a Farm by Max Kutner, so you can check it out there.
Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The Farm Report. This show, like all 35 of our weekly programs, are available for free on iTunes, on Stitcher Smart Radio. But we hope you'll visit our website, www.heritageradionetwork.org. We are a member-supported organization, so if you believe in our work, please support us by clicking that Donate tab and becoming a member today. Thanks so much. Keep on listening. Stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.